Greetings antique radio enthusiasts. Welcome to another edition of Antique Radio Archaeology. On today's episode we're going to be talking about the Chelsea radio model number 115 amplifier. Now the model 115 amplifier came out about 1924 and it came out uh, after the model 113 the Model 113 amplifier uh, was an improvement, slight improvement over the earlier amplifiers, uh, the Model 111. And uh, the big difference between this and the 113 is they simplified it quite a bit. Uh, the Model 113 has two real stats. It has uh, jacks for input, or phone jacks for input and output. It has uh, cinch terminals for input and output and different stages. This one just broke it down to you have some cinch terminals on the input. You have the phone and speaker jacks, which are actually pin terminals or pin um, sockets. And then you have some cinch terminals in the back for the power. Now on the 113, all the uh, wires went inside and you had to hook them up internally. This you can hook up externally. And the big thing is the one rheostat, which uh, makes things a lot easier. Of course, the one rheostat yeah, controls both filaments on each tube. Now, it's a two-stage amplifier. Uh, you have your transformers, you have your rheostat, and your two tubes. Now, this one needs some work. Uh, it's not in too bad a shape cosmetically. Uh, there are a couple of blatant problems. Uh, number one is the I am missing one of the one of the uh, the knobs which for the cinch terminal on the back, which is no big deal. <laughs> the biggest problem that I'm dealing with is right here. The input terminals are not supposed to be here. They're supposed to be down here. Why somebody relocated them from down here to up here is it's beyond me. It just makes no sense. Um, the only other issue I have are the transformers are bad, so I will have to recore both transformers. Uh, and of course I'll have to get some tubes for it, but uh, the rheostat's in good shape and the case itself is in pretty good shape. So. It's not going to be that difficult. I just need to uh, go ahead and address those issues. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, as always, uh, the first thing that I like to do is go ahead and take lots of pictures, which I've already done, of the insides. Uh, the other thing that I've done is I've gone ahead and drew out a schematic for it so that I have a proper schematic to uh, work from and when I go to put it all back together. It's something everyone should always do, especially if there are no schematics in existence, which there aren't in this case. So uh, let's go ahead and start tearing it down. Move the tube sockets.
I've got it all broke down into parts. Um, I'm going to go ahead and clean all this stuff up. Uh, I know this is good. I need to check those transformers. Secondary, nothing on the primary. Bad. That's a primary. This must be secondary. Ah, I got one good transformer. That's good to know. Okay, so I only have to recore one. Not bad. I'll take that. So I've gone ahead, this transformer here was recorded in another video, so if you'd like to see how that's done, you can look at that video. Uh, just go ahead and uh, go onto my page there, and you will find uh, restoring a Chelsea Model 50 transformer video. This one here is the good one, so I need to go ahead and clean this one up. Yeah. So all the parts are cleaned up and ready to go. Now we're at a point where I was kind of faced with a little bit of a dilemma. I uh, was debating on whether or not to hold on to some of this wiring, but as you can see, um, that's not a good idea. This is all just cracking and falling apart. The insulation shot on all of it. It's just, it's just dry rotted. Uh, you can't you can't expect these things to last another hundred years if you don't do something about that. So I do have some cloth covered wire. It's 20 gauge and I'm going to go ahead and replace all this. So that's 
definitely uh, the best thing to do here. It's the safest thing since I do plan on using this thing. You know, I don't. It's not going to sit on a shelf and look good. It's going to be used uh, as an amplifier. So might as well do it upright. So a lot of people complain saying, "Yeah, well that." Ruins the antique value. Well, what good is antique value if the dang thing doesn't work? I'm sorry. So. One down. And a few more to go. Okay, so all the uh, garbage wire has been replaced. What I've done here is I've gone ahead and taken all these little wiring harnesses that I redid the cables on and I labeled them in accordance with this little hand drawing that I did when I first before I took the uh, amplifier apart now what I did was I actually labeled okay A is going to be this harness here and that goes to one of the phone jacks so that's this one right here so A and then I've got F I Okay, all of them match the little labels that I have on here, and I'll tear these off after I install them in the amplifier. So before I get started, uh, what I always do is compare my hand drawing of the layout to the schematic, which I've already done, but I'll just to go over it real quick. Uh, my B plus here is coming over, hitting this, the bottom part of the primary. Coming back, hitting that phone jack, and then coming over here and hitting the speaker jack. So if I follow B+, plus, bottom of the primary, hitting the phone jack and the speaker jack. Okay. My B-, minus A+, plus is coming down and hitting the filament. A-, minus B+, plus is coming down, it's hitting the filaments. My A- minus is hitting the wiper on that rheostat and it's hitting the bottom of the grid on the transformer and it's coming back and hitting the bottom of the grid of the other transformer. So, follow my A- minus down, boom, the wiper, bottom of the grid, bottom of the grid circuit. And then, uh, let's see, if I follow my phone jack back, it's going to hit the plate, which it does. And then, uh, also hitting that plate is the primary of the second transformer, which it does. Okay, that's good already checked those the plate off of this one 
should be hitting the speaker jack, which it does. And the bottom of the resistor should be hitting this filament, both filaments, which it does. Okay, this does match that. The next step in this process is to figure out what kind of finish I have on the case. And in order to do that, I'm going to use these three products right here to determine what it is. Now, the 1920s radios typically used a shellac or a lacquer. Uh, Chelsea Radio was known for using shellac throughout their entire production. So, um, if it's the original finish, it'll probably be shellac. If it's not, it could be lacquer. Uh, the other possibilities are varnish or polyurethane. And this will tell me which one is which. Now I'm going to start with the denatured alcohol. That will tell me whether or not I have a shellac. Now what I'm going to do is put a little drop of it on there and after a minute or two it should get tacky if it's shellac. Because shellac is dissolved in alcohol. So. <clears throat> If that doesn't work, then I know I don't have a shellac. I'm going to go ahead and test next for lacquer. And do the same thing. If it dissolves and, and becomes tacky, then I know, okay, I've got a lacquer finish. If that doesn't work, then it could be either varnish or polyurethane. And acetone will help me figure that out. And the reason why is because acetone will dissolve varnish it will not dissolve polyurethane. So, if I put that on there and it dissolves or it becomes tacky, then I know, okay, I've got a varnish on there. If it doesn't, if it just sits there and does nothing, then I know for a fact I have polyurethane. So, let's go ahead and uh, give it a shot, see what we got. Yep. It's got polyurethane on it. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and fill these holes with some epoxy resin. And I'm going to do it from the back. Now in order to do that, what I need to do is put a little bit of tape over the holes. And what I have done is I've got a little bit of scotch tape on here so that gives me a nice 
flat surface that's going to be on here and I'm going to put just a little bit of mineral oil on and that's going to act as a mold release Okay, I got it sanded down, so now I'm going to use a little bit of pumice stone and some mineral oil. So this is the finest pumice you can buy. It's called Rotten Stone. And that's going to be on my final coat here. There we go. So now I'm going to use some rubbing compound. And this is what's called a lacquer stick. Okay, and there you have it. Get that started. loudspeaker This plate could be used for either the receiver or the amplifier, depending on which way they face it, and they went ahead and drilled the holes accordingly. This was obviously drilled for the amplifier, but it could have easily been used for the receiver itself, so they pretty pretty smart, actually, to go ahead and finish the plate on both sides and just deal with drilling. tighten all this stuff up later. I just don't know where everything's going to land until I get it all on there. Go ahead and tighten those down.
purpose of that is to allow this to get close, but also to allow for some friction. So I've got the wiper centered, knob centered. So, front panel assembly is complete with the exception of tightening everything down. Now I need to start wiring things. Basically, all my connections are made. So now it's just a matter of tightening up all the bolts. Pretty much wraps it up. Well, 
actually sounds pretty decent for uh, for a little uh, two-stage jam. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, call this restoration complete. Well, that wraps up another episode of Antique Radio Archaeology. Uh, today's project was a lot more than I bargained for. Uh, a lot went into refinishing it, trying to cover up uh, polyurethane with shellac is not the easiest thing in the world to do. And, um, of course, I, I wasn't expecting to have to replace all the wiring either, but, uh, you know, it, it is what it is, and now it's pretty much like a new amp. But uh, this uh, amplifier uh, was mentioned in the Northeastern Radio and Incorporated catalog of 1924, which describes the amplifier as follows. It is designed as a companion piece for the Chelsea number 110 receiver. When used with that set, will operate a loudspeaker with good volume on both local and distant stations. When Chelsea number 50 amplifying transformers are used, clear reproduction without distortion is ensured. Either storage batteries or dry cells may be used, will operate successfully with any type of receiving set. Mahogany finish cabinet, bake light panels, single control, back connections for battery. The selling price without tubes and batteries was $16. So, pretty impressive amp for $16. So, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, please hit the like button. If you'd like to see more content like this, please hit subscribe. In the meantime, happy restorations, everyone. We'll see you next video. Goodbye.